Welcome to Mormons, Mystics, and Muons, where we focus on reconstruction and recontextualization through an integration of science, psychology, consciousness, and philosophy. And today, Elton, I was going to, so we're talking a bit about before recording. So I, I got triggered this week, yesterday, online. Um, I was a part of this group on... Western esotericism and like the overlap with Mormonism. And I shared a news article, I think it was from 2019, a few years ago. And I, it's about this cult leader that I served a mission with. And, um, I'll show you that story in, in a second. Well, I guess I'll, okay. I'll, I'll go back to that story. So I, I served in Montana Billings. Uh, mission and there's an elder elder Coltharp uh, John Coltharp and he's, he's a nice guy I liked him he was this yeah kind of skinny uh, guy that really really knew his deep doctrine and was just all about that I mean I was into deep doctrine and stuff but he was all about it he gave me I threw it away a few years ago, but he gave me like a stack of Adam God stuff. And it was like a temple ceremonies from back Brigham Young time. And cause Adam God teaching. So mm -hmm. Adam God teaching for listeners that don't know is Brigham Young, his main contribution to weird doctrines of the church was that Adam is God. He's the only God that we need to know about. It's basically, I guess God came down as Adam in the garden of, Eden. And uh, I mean, it's this difficult thing for people to reconcile with doctrine. Although I think it ties into this kind of oneness and, um, in spirituality, but so yeah, he, so church leaders now have moved away and discounted Adam God stuff. Even though Brigham Young said it was like super important to have a testimony of, and then he even, he even backed away from, but anyway, he had given me like, like 20, 30 pages of Adam God stuff. We always told him when I mean, he was so in deep, deep doctrine. I remember we had a, one of the missionaries was really into like hunting and trapping and stuff. He would trap animals on his mission and they killed a squirrel actually. And Elder Coulthard, I think chastised them using uh, Joseph Smith's, I think chastisement of the people when they killed that snake or whatever. Yeah. That so, was in Zion's camp. Yeah. Right, when they'd kill the snake. He's like, who's serious about this stuff? Um, and we always told him, you're either going to be an apostle or an apostate. <laughs> and fast forward to four or five, uh, three years ago, three or four years ago, when one of my one of the guys I served the mission with sent me a message, sent me a news article, uh, that about Coltharp and how he was in jail. So he was, do you remember that case where there were the girls that were being kept in like these sub freezing temperatures in Utah in a barrel? Mm, they're alive. They, they, uh, so this is okay. So this article that I shared on the post and now I read back, read this article again, and a lot of things made a lot more sense understanding about like altered states of consciousness and synchronicities and whatnot. So uh, John Coltharp and Stephen Schaefer were the two guys and they ended up creating a cult. It was mainly the two of them. I think there was maybe one or two other people involved. Um, and it was called the Knights of the Crystal Blade. And they ended up marrying each other's eight-year-old daughters or something. And they were out on the, out on the land, uh, out in the wilderness. And I think one of them's ex-wife or something was, was the one that reported them or something. Anyway, they, they eventually got the 
kids and um, kids were safe and they're in mm-hmm. jail now, but they, he, they both maintained like this was from God. This was, um, you know, people just don't understand. I think Cole Harper's like, you know, my understanding of human sexuality and like evolution and what, and you know, this is, it doesn't fit culture, but mm-hmm. you know, this is, um, but anyway, this article was really interesting because it talked about the whole history of these, how they got to where they were and uh, talked more about the other guy, Stephen Schaefer. Um, he, he had an experience when he was, uh, I think he had a tough home life, which is a common theme. I think these childhood traumas, he had an experience when he was a kid where he gazed into a flame uh, candle and it turned all green or something. He had some altered state experience and I think transcending time and space or something. And that stuck with him. He, I think he read the Bible like eight or nine times in the Book of Mormon, like 18 times or something before he went on this mission or something. So he served a mission. And then he, I think he started, yeah, he started going through these different groups. I think he was, he was creating scripture for one of these groups or something, but somehow it was basically these people, it was very Dungeons and Dragons, like, um, kind of hey now, fantasy. I'm a big Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> fan. Well, they, but I know what you mean. They're kind of LARPing, like, uh, just living out their, their fantasy. It sounds like, well, one of the terrible ways, one of, yeah, the article talked about, it's a pretty good piece, uh, investigative, I'll, I'll link it in the show notes, uh, investigative journalism on this. I think one of the groups that he, that was instrumental for him was this group where they would do role-playing and somehow they got really interested in consciousness and states of consciousness. And there was an experience where one of the guys, according to the article, reached such a high state of consciousness that he had them gather up all the dice in the house and he rolled all sixes, uh, which sounds so like bizarre. Si- all at the same time. All at the same time. Yeah. And, and, and these people, you know, in the article are like, you know, this, there was no trickery in this, like this was real. And it's like a um, mega Yahtzee. Yeah. And so to me, I'm like, oh, this is, I mean, this is Jung's concept of synchronicity and, you know, people that report near death experiences or Kundalini awakenings or these spontaneous spiritual awakenings report really high instances, instances of synchronicities, which, which are basically secular spiritual experiences of a causal coincidences between two things in the universe. Um, and so, yeah, so there, there was, and then if, there's another episode or a part of the story where they, I don't know how they, I forget how they got hooked up with each other, but I think they were out in the wilderness and they had already married each other's daughters or whatever. And Stephen was looking at the fire and saw it turn green or whatever. And Coltharp said, like, what are you, what are you seeing? And he's like, do you see it green too? And he's like, no, but you know, or I think Coltharp said, like, do you see the green fire? So I don't know. There's some weird experience that they shared together, but there was an interesting line in the article that I guess Coltharp said, you know, well, we have to figure out why, what our callings are, because this wouldn't be happening to us unless we were meant to do something. And so I think it's, so I posted on this group just about how like there needs it needs to be more normalized, like altered states of experience, mystical experiences, which I mean, there's a wide, there's a spectrum from mystical experiences to psychoses, you know, spiritual awakenings to psychopathology, you know, it's not a clear box here or there. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the big factors in it is how one, the context, whether people have any sort of framework in which they can integrate it in. And unfortunately, often it's interpreted through the lens of religion of like God and Satan, good and evil. And that Mm -hmm. leads to these self judgment and repression, judgment of other people. And, and then also I think the other aspect is 
how much people are willing to look inward and integrate their shadow, the parts of themselves that they've judged or repressed. And it seems like a lot of people that either don't have that framework and have this inner shame and guilt and self-worth, it's tempting and easy to slide towards this path of like, well, I'm special. Like I need to be special. I need to be important. Um, cause they don't want to be crazy. And these are really powerful, real or been real experiences. Mm-hmm. And so they slide towards this narcissistic perspective and then they kind of have to double down on it because I think it goes back and forth between the self doubt and moving forward and you kind of commit and then you kind of have to keep going. So I posted in this group about how, yeah, we need to bring awareness to this and the mental health community and just these concepts of Jung and altered states of consciousness and mystical experiences uh, so that people can learn how to navigate these and um, you you move past guilt and shame. And somebody, somebody responded and said, well, you know, all this new age claptrap has nothing to do with Jung's actual theories, right? And I got triggered because I, I've come up with that a lot. One, this like blanket dismissing of quote unquote new age, which really, I don't know anybody that actually considers themselves new age is more of a pejorative term. Yeah. And then non-specific, um, like they don't actually say what they have issues with, or I think it's a bold claim to say that it doesn't have any overlap with Jung. I mean, Jung was interested in astrology, believed in a psychic phenomenon, believed in a universal unconsciousness, alchemy. Um, I think new age does venture into, I mean, it's, it's myth and it's a lot of myth and storytelling. Grant, I think myths are helpful in as much as they help you and Mm -hmm. are internally consistent and are harmful because everything's ultimately a myth. Um, but yeah, I've, I've particularly got a lot of pushback on people that say, Oh, don't, you know, don't you dare talk about like quantum physics and, you know, relate it to any spiritual stuff. You know, I've taken physics classes in high school or in college or whatever. And yeah, there's some valid points of people really taking a leap of quantum physics and then jumping all the way to, really extrapolating at this high spiritual level. But I mean, I think that there is such a connection between philosophy and quantum physics. So I I agree. I agree. And I was reading an article earlier this week about um, a discovery made in the quantum quantum theory realm uh, where they were, they had entangled particles that were kept 30 meters apart. And they basically were just showing what had been shown before that there could be there can be a state of a particle that could be 30 meters from another particle and it can basically, um, they, they both interact with each other, even though they're seemingly too far away from each other to do that. It's the spooky action at a distance that Einstein mm-hmm. called it. And the interesting thing about the article to me was how the person writing it seemed to be wanting to make kind of clear that that kind of theories from the past aren't, as good anymore as this new these new breakthroughs in science and and i think the first sentence of the article opened with something like um you know unlike ancient cosmologists who viewed the you know the realm outside as uh, i'm gonna butcher this but it was it was basically saying like ancient cosmo cosmologists did it wrong newer scientific scientifically geared cosmologists are doing it right. And it's, to me, it was kind of like, well, hold on a second. In a hundred years, what's the likelihood that people say something about how we're doing something now is completely wrong, just because they have new, a new framework that they're operating in. Hmm. Uh, I think that these myths that keep kind of coming back, well, well, like, astrology and alchemy being the esoteric 
kind of counterparts or at least the beginning stages of say chemistry and astronomy those things kind of stay with us as we evolve and so they'll keep recurring it's like the parts of us that as maybe um, lower level life forms or mammals or reptiles or whatever kind of things we evolved from uh, they, those parts stay with us. And so I think those esoteric ideas keep recurring because they're coming back because they're part of our entire uh, human kind of experience in history. In other words, we're not going to get rid of religion or alchemy or astrology. They're actually just still part of us, but they're going to continue to evolve and change alongside new scientific ideas. Uh, and so kind of going back to that story you shared with the cult leader, I think there is a danger zone that people can fall into when they look too deeply into, I, I think when they're, when they're using the filter of like a particular religion, like Christianity or Mormonism, um, but they're still trying to reconcile the, what they're seeing as revelation or synchronicities and kind of gearing it all through that lens. Uh, I think we're probably all in danger of doing mm -hmm. that, uh, where what's really going on is always going to be different than what we're, what we're perceiving is going on. Kind of yeah. that hum humility of recognizing that there's, there is something beyond what even we can see, smell, taste, touch, and even s see as a synchronicity or even feel as a revelation. There's always a, something even beyond that. Well, I think, I mean, I think the big, the big hidden variable here is that people approach these subjects from a specific framework. They're going into it with certain postulates or axioms that, you know, are just assumed any theor theorem that you have, any proof you have to say, well, give me, give me these givens, postulates, axioms. If you allow me to assert these things as true without giving you any proof, then I'll be able to go on with the rest of the proof. And so science is largely viewed from materialism. And so that's just something that people approach all of these things. And from a materialist perspective, yeah, they're all crazy, but idealism um, is a whole other philosophical perspective that's been on, on the plate and discussed back and forth between idealism and materialism. And it, yeah, you have to, you have to be aware of what you're trying to fit things into. And so people do that with a religion is like, well, this is what I believe. And this is what I want to believe. And it's really uncomfortable if I have to walk away from this idea of this being true. Um, and so I'm just going to try to integrate everything from within that, within that perspective. And that happens with science and materialism, but it's interesting, the hubris that we have and kind of the two steps forward, one step back. I mean, you look at Isaac Newton and we revere him as you know, so instrumental and a genius. And, you know, he's the father of classical physics, but he was also into alchemy and into all these mystical things as well. And they were not, uh, there was, he was able to integrate them together. Same thing with quantum physics. I mean, if you look at Schrodinger, Planck and Einstein, I mean, there's some very fascinating quotes where they were all, they all seemed to be idealists in the, and they all believed that the universe reality was made of consciousness and that, that everything is like a uh, consciousness that, you know, matter is something that happens within consciousness. And so, they were the ones that were able to, they were the fathers of quantum physics and that was the two steps forward. But then it's kind of gone back to more traditional thinkers of like, okay, well now how do we, yeah, we believe in quantum physics, but how do we explain this from a materialist perspective? And mm -hmm. so, and I think, I think we've reached the limits of that and more and more people are shifting to idealism, which explains a lot more things. Um, but in, in getting triggered by this, because I was like, you know, I really just want to, there's, there's a part of me that gets triggered of like feeling like I have to prove, um, or get, 
I mean, I used to like Apollo on my mission. I used to like Bible bashing, um, but I've since realized like you can't change, can't change people's minds. Um, and it was interesting because in this, so I responded back and I was like, I'm not sure exactly what you view as new age claptrap, uh, as the stuff that I shared that I experienced or in the article. And I'm curious as to whether you really feel like Jung's perspectives have nothing at all to do with them because of astrology and psychic phenomenon and synchronicity and all these things. I think it overlaps a lot. I'm just seeing if he's actually open to um, discussing these things because it sounded like he was more wanting to tell me that they had nothing to do with them, even though it poses a question. But it made me realize a lucid dream that I had as a teenager. And I finally understood the dream um, because it applied to this. I was doing, I was getting into lucid dreaming in high school. I don't know why I thought it was fascinating. So lucid dreaming is gaining awareness that you're in a dream while you're in a dream. And there's certain things that you can do to help train yourself to do it. Have you been into lucid dreaming much or tried? I, I understand it a little bit. And I think I haven't like fully committed to trying, but I know that I've had a couple of lucid dreams and, um, and other times where I feel like I just have very limited control, but mm -hmm. not, not like a full control kind of experience. Yeah. There's actually some really fascinating scientific research that this one guy has been doing for a while on it. Um, and so they, you know, there's different stagings of lucidity, starting at just being aware that you're in a dream and then higher stages of awareness are being able to control the dream. And then the highest stage of awareness is being able to have access to the next level up the consciousness of the person that is dreaming. So as the, the dream ego can access the waking life, uh, information, which you, you typically you can't access within the dream. Um, and there are certain ways that you can train yourself to, do this. There's some fascinating stuff with functional MRIs where they can see what happens when you gain lucidity, your prefrontal cortex, I believe goes online, um, or a certain part of your brain that's typically suppressed goes online once you gain lucidity. And then your amygdala actually quiets down because you realize like, oh, this is a dream. It's not actually real, mm -hmm. real, but, but you can do reality checks where you're basically you question whether you're in a dream or not during the day. And you try to either like put your finger through your hand or look at some text, look away, look at, back at the text and see if you see if it changes, see if you can change things, think about, Oh, what would I do if I was dreaming? And if you do that enough, then you get in the habit. And then when you're dreaming, you will do that. And then hopefully you'll realize that you're in a dream. Anyway, I was fascinated with this and um, because it's like it unlocks a whole third of your life and you can do whatever you want. You can fly, meet people. And so I only remember one dream where I gained lucidity and it was a low level of lucidity as you see, but I realized I was in, in a dream and I was on a bus and I was trying to convince everybody else in the bus that we were all in a dream, which shows that I wasn't that lucid because if I was, I would just, well, I would realize it was pointless to argue with myself and to, or I would just control them into believing me, but nobody was listening. So I ended up jumping out of the moving bus to prove to them, um, that it was, that it was a dream because it was very frustrating, uh, which is very interesting parallels to this last year of, um, just kind of re changing how I view reality and feeling mm -hmm. like, oh, well, all these things click and integrate and one being kind of disappointed at how many people just don't have any interest in these things and then getting suckered into the idea of like trying to convince people or to get people interested in it, um, mm -hmm. or to get, you know, engage with people that, uh, obviously are so opinionated. They're actually just trying to reinforce what they already believe. And so, uh, yeah, it gave me some interesting insight of like, yeah, I just, I need to not get distracted along the way and actually just share the insight I have to the people that are already interested. I realize yeah. you can't like a chemistry reaction. I can't add energy into the system because people's energy 
that comes from within that comes when your life crashes down that comes when you have a divorce a faith crisis whatnot like you supply the energy um but somebody who has insight or awareness you can that person can catalyze and you can help people integrate stuff and you can give people a framework so that they don't they don't have to fall into the existential crisis nihilism or just jump from one side uh, to the other, you know, from being sure that the church is true to being sure that atheism is true. Uh, the religion of non-religion. That's yeah. what Watt calls it. Yeah. And I, I've had some of those same thoughts. It, it's funny because I, sometimes when I get really excited about some of these concepts, I get the sense that everybody already knows it. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't know, I often feel like I could talk about something that I've learned, but um, but the people around me already know this, and they've already made a decision about it. They've already concluded that it's either, um, like, not true, quote unquote, or it's not uh, meaningful, or it's not worth talking about. I don't know how much of that is just me talking to myself, like giving you know, a little bit of self doubt. I mean, here we are on a podcast, we're definitely trying to, to influence or impact somebody. And hopefully it's for, it's for good. Because like you say, there's more than just two sides to this argument. Although I think the argument like the, um, the, the kind of the conversation between idealism and materialism, it, yes, ultimately, I think everything does emerge from consciousness. I think consciousness is the bottom, but I think materialism is a component of reality. And so it's like we get caught up in it's either or, Mm. you know, it's either or. And the more I understand quantum realities, the more I recognize that it's it's both. The answer is often both. Well, they're nested within each other. So yeah, materialism or classical Nasty. physics is a framework that is, I mean, it's a myth that works pretty well within it's a, a certain framework. Yeah. Um, but when you reach the edges of that framework, when you exceed, when you're getting out of the bounds of the postulates of the axioms, um, then it starts to break down. So yeah, it's not that you abandon it, but I mean, I, th- I view it as this idea of somebody who's been staring at a TV screen uh, their whole life really closely, and they're watching this program on it, and they've just been engrossed in it their whole life. And you've had an experience where you've been able to take a step back and realize, oh, there's a TV screen that I'm looking at. And you're trying to convince the other person, but they're like, no, these things, you know, I'm seeing this because they interpret what you're saying as oh, there's nothing on the TV screen. That's not real. That's, you know, no, it's real, but it's within this context. And Mm -hmm. you have to be aware that it's on a screen, but then also still keep hold of the content itself because it's meaningful. It doesn't mean that it's not real um, or that's not useful, that materialism or classical physics, that you abandon it because it's really useful. um, But you just have to have the context of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's fair. That's like a modern version of Plato's cave with the TV screen, oh, yeah. I think. And <laughs> I think it's caves within caves within caves, you know, and getting out of one, it always means becoming part of another. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Boy, but that lucid dream, it's, I can't remember a dream from when I was a teenager. Ooh. I don't think that must I, be kind of a special thing to hold on to. Because dreams have, are just us. It's all a part of us. It's always all us. I have four dreams. Some of them are recurring. And I, I see them all now for what they were saying to me in my life. Um, and it's very fascinating. I mean, they speak to these wow. core wounds that I have. One, I experienced just pure. One in college, I experienced just pure love. Uh, I don't know who I was with, um, but I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh, that's what love is. And to me, that was like this lodestar of, okay, this is what it feels like 
you'll recognize it later in life because really reference reference point mm -hmm. for everything yeah. else because these things you don't know what you don't know so you don't know you don't know what a healthy relationship is like if you actually don't have a model for a healthy relationship you don't know what how do you know what love is like um the same thing with spiritual experiences uh mystical experiences like you don't know until you experience and so and you don't know what other people have experienced so so yeah there's a couple other um things that are very interesting one was the, yeah the what a gift dream. What a gift to have like yourself give you that reference point for what love is. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we're inside our own heads, everything, you know, the idea, the hermetic principle, number one of mentalism, that the universe is, is the mind, Every, everything is happening inside the mind. So yeah, um, I tell my kids that bad dreams are actually good and good dreams are bad. Because when you're having a good dream and you get, you wake up, oh, it's not true. It didn't really happen. Oh, that's bad. But if you have a bad dream, you wake up, you should celebrate. It, it's that's not true. Dream. It didn't really happen. And so when kids come in crying from a nightmare, I'm like, oh, you had a good dream. <laughs> so uh, that's funny. Try to lighten the mood. But tell me about your apocalyptic dream. Mm -hmm. Well, my dad was is still very much into like apocalypse and it's all about Russia. It's always been about Russia. And um, this was probably influenced by it. But I just remember this very vivid dream of a nuclear bomb going off on the horizon, slow motion. So you can see the mushroom cloud and just this bright burning, uh, you know, cloud. Uh, and I remember we were like packing, we're leaving, going somewhere and just the sur very surreal, very vivid and yeah, probably influenced by that. I think my mom said that she was really saddened at one point to one of us boys came up to her and was like, Hey, you know, am I even going to be able to grow up and mm -hmm. you know because our dad was always telling us that the end of the world was happening yeah you know, this summer next summer this october and so that that was a very yeah really sticks with me i can still see the images I, yeah i had a lot of that with my dad also hmm. um you have to hold you just yeah you I want to hold nights. on to something i think that's why people are into it it's like yeah this world yeah, yeah. is there needs to be something more There needs to be something better. You need to have something to look forward to, mm -hmm. even if it's I, yeah. the collapse of everything. I also wonder how much of the, like the idea that the world is ending as it seems to me like at about middle age or beyond that really can take hold of certain people. And I wonder if it's just the inability to reconcile your own impending doom like it's a kind of an unconscious manifestation of the recognition that you have this as you're, as you're young, you have nothing but the future ahead of you. You mm -hmm. have a smaller, you know, an increasing amount of time in your past. And at some point you have as much time in your past as you have in your future, give or take with, you know, presumably with a, average life expectancy. And at some point, what is in your future actually starts to be smaller in comparison to the years in your past. And I wonder if there's an unconscious kind of inability to, to reconcile that and it manifests as uh, end of the world theories and conspiracies around the Could be. I know, you know, end of things. I know with my dad and uh, Somebody else I know that would fall under the prepper tag. And then I've been looking up like Julie Rowe and kind of the Mormon prepper communities. I think it's actually, it's exciting. I actually watched um, Doomsday Preppers a bit too. I don't know if you ever watched that show, but this Very is bad. something that is exciting and that they, it's funny because they're all prepping for a specific 
disaster too, which I mean, there's this guy in New York city that was preparing for Yellowstone to blow. And so he would run drills and stuff, but I'm like, what are the chances that when the apocalypse yeah. comes that it's Yellowstone? Like what if it's a solar flare? What if it's this or that? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's Maybe. something to hold. I think it's something to hold on to and actually have meaning and purpose. You know, I'm stuck in this dead end job. You know, I want, and I relate to this because as a kid, I wanted a tornado to come through. I didn't want anybody to get hurt, but I wanted some excitement. I wanted something to shake yeah. things up to, I think it's well, at least from my perspective, more a discomfort, a, an escapism, a discomfort with the, what your life is and a desire for it to be something more, to have more meaning, to have more purpose. Yeah. You know, I was thinking of the, uh, but my, my dad would spend many hours into the night. I can recall, uh, talking to like friends of his who were kind of of this conspiracy mindset. And, you know, at the time it was Bill Clinton or whoever, and, uh, the Gulf war or just it's, it's all, it's always something in all times. There's always reason to be fearful. There's always reason to be pessimistic, um, about the future or to kind of uh, apply your own framework to what's going on in the world and try and connect the dots or or read into what's happening. So I think there's never been a shortage of that probably. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think in our human history, our human civilization has had those collapse events so many times. It is the recurring, it's the same thing In, in our evolutionary history. If it's part of us, it continues to recur. It will continue to come up because at some point, you know, all but three of us were wiped out by some snowstorm or something in some localized area. And those memories, those like collective memories just keep, they come out in the collective unconscious. At least that's how I kind of reconcile some of that. But that imagery of the mushroom cloud you talk about on the horizon, I find it fascinating that mushroom clouds are the, advent of nuclear weapons like nuclear weapons are underground it's like mushrooms lives are mostly all underground it's only when they're flowering Mm -hmm. that they come up above ground and at the end of all things we can envision these mushroom clouds covering all the civilized parts of the world is that you know is the mushroom the way of resetting it's often if trees fall in the forest things die it's the fungi that do the work to renew Mm -hmm. and then the mushrooms emerge out and uh, spread their spores and it's kind of starts all over. So there's just an interesting connection there. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, all right. We, uh, we were going to talk about continue on with the plan of salvation. Yeah. And so we talked about Garden of Eden the fall last time. And it's kind of a part of the plan of salvation. Um, but another aspect that, we're going to use a lot of quotes from D. Michael Quinn's book, Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview. So starting with the nature of God. So I'm going to read, there's going to be a lot of quotes. I think you'll find them fascinating because you have not read his book and then you can kind of comment on them. Uh, but he said, in June 1843, Times and Seasons, now edited by, edited by Apostle John Taylor, began publishing Alexander Niebauer's two install, installments on the Jews. Niebauer was a Jewish convert from London, and this was Mormonism's first explicit instruction about the Kabbalah. So Kabbalah is the mm, esoteric form of Judaism, mystical form of Judaism. Uh, Even polemicist Hamblin, so this is Bill William Hamblin, uh, who, who wrote for Farms. And D. Michael Quinn is quite sensitive about, I mean, I think he really got torn up by uh, really got criticized by apologists for his his books. And so he really hits back. And so you can kind of hear that in this. So he calls them polemicists. Um, even polemicist Hamlin has acknowledged it is indisputable that Niebauer mentions or cites from Kabbalistic texts in an article in Times and Seasons. Nevertheless, Hamlin wrote a 75-page Farms attack on an article. So Farms is the uh, apologists, not fair, but Foundation for Ancient Research on Mormon Studies, I think, attack on an article by Lance S. Owens that Kabbalistic ideas influenced Joseph Smith's teachings. 
claiming special credentials to write about the Kabbalah, Hamlin actually misrepresented scholarly understanding of the Kabbalah, both current and at Smith's times. For example, Hamlin claimed, quote, although Kabbalistic literature uses anthropomorphic language extensively, the Kabbalists were insistent that such language was strictly metaphorical and did not literally describe the nature of God. So they're talking about this idea that God as a man, his polemic frequently cited three Jewish scholars of the Kabbalah, but did not acknowledge that they specifically contradicted Hamlin's claim. Gershom Sholem wrote of the Kabbalah's, quote, almost provocatively conspicuous anthropomorphism. And Moshe Edel wrote that the Zohar, which is its text, one of its main texts, quote, is manifestly anthropomorphic, end quote. Elliot R. Wolfson insisted that, quote, in the Kabbalah, we are dealing with a full human form, end quote, of God. Hamlin also willfully ignored Sholem's emphasis that medieval Jewish scholar Moses Maimonides rejected the Kabbalah because it described God as having a body. Allen's book gave the scholarly assessment of the early 1800s concerning the Kabbalists. So this is talking about this guy, Allen, who wrote a book that was around when Joseph Smith um, was, so it could have been likely was used and read by Joseph Smith. Quote, they represent deity as existing in a human form, end quote. Hamlin emphasized his own view of the Kabbalah's content, while English language scholarship of the Kabbalah in the early 1800s anticipated Joseph Smith's statement in 1843. God, quote, the father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the son also, end quote. Modern scholars, at least the reputable ones, do not disagree with Allen's statement, nor would they regard Smith's statement as inconsistent with the Kabbalah's view. Likewise, concerning polytheism, John Allen quoted the same passage about three degrees from the Zohar that was in Smith's 1842 excerpt. With additions in 1816 and 1830, the book prefaced the same quote by observing, quote, observing that there are numerous passages in the Kabbalistic writings which are far more intelligible on the supposition that their authors had some belief of a plurality in the divine being and that in that plurality of Trinity than they are upon any other supposition, end quote. This was also Eisenmenger's previously published view. On the other hand, Hamlin has insisted, quote, although some Jewish opponents of Kabbalism accused them of polytheism, the Kabbalists themselves rejected this criticism, end quote. While Hamlin's argument may technically be true, it is besides the point. A little more here. English language scholarship in the early 1800s maintained that the Kabbalah promoted the idea that there was more than one God. That is the obvious answer to Hamlin's rhetorical question, quote, why is the Mormon concept of the plurality of God's found plurality of gods found in 1832 if it derives from the Zohar, end quote. Smith's 1832 revelation, Doctrine and Covenants 76, announced that mortals who become, quote, priests of the Most High after the order of Melchizedek, as it is written, they are gods, even the sons of God, end quote. His 1843 revelation, 132, proclaimed, quote, then shall they be gods because they have all power and the angels are subject unto them, end quote. In April 1844, Smith's King Follett discourse instructed Mormons that, quote, you have got to learn how to be gods yourself and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you, end quote. And 11 days before his death in June, the prophet said, quote, I wish to declare I have always and in all congregations when I have preached on the subject of deity, it has been the plurality of gods, end quote. So then that's interesting. So he, at the end of his life, you know, in Nauvoo in the last years, he was studying with Niebauer and incorporating a lot of Kabbalah. He was studying Hebrew with Niebauer, but likely these other things. And you really see it changing his cosmology with King Fall's discourse, which was in the last year that he was alive. So he was really continuing to evolve and shape things up uh, up until the end. Yeah, very interesting. I wonder what would have come out if he would have lived longer through all of these uh these studies that he was doing or this uh, learning. So this is kind of the problem with Western or it's been a, a feature of, of Western religion for a long, long time is the conversation between one God or many gods. So Kab Kabbalah and esoteric Judaism sounds like was actually, uh, it, it was of the mind of many gods and was it then, you know, Moses at about that point where it became more about uh, one God? Because Je Jehovah, as I remember, or Yahweh, 
was uh, really just one of many gods. He was like the yeah. agriculture god, mm -hmm. and he got a huge promotion <laughs> yeah. with Moses to um, to the the supreme god. Mm -hmm. And if you see in us, or the only god, they picked the wrong guy. They picked Yahweh. Um, yeah, yeah, that was really interesting yeah. to see. Like, um, my dad's on a big Yahweh kick, or Yeshua, yeah, Yahweh. Um, I don't know how he. Yeah, a few years back, he started really emphasizing the name, and that's a that's a thing I see with people really focusing on the name of God. Um, so I looked into it a bit, and yeah, it's interesting that Yahweh was actually just one God, and then they're like, and you see this in the Old Testament too, where they're like, there's showdowns between Yah Yahweh versus Baal, and I mean they're actually like these two gods that are fighting, and Yahweh is just supposedly better. But it's usually the the victor of the human battle whose God is the victor, right? And then often the, the losing God becomes kind of subservient or secondary. I know there was a, like this happened in Egypt where Egypt had Ra as their sun God. And then after a pretty big conflict and kind of a change in the government, there was another God named, I think, Amon something like that. And they, they kind of just made them together as one God, Amon Ra. And I could be misrepresenting that a little bit, but it's something like that. There's usually, it's a, a, the conflict of gods is really a mirror of the conflict of the humans going on who worship the gods and whoever wins in the human conflicts means that that's the God that, that kind of wins, I think. But this Western struggle of the one gods versus many gods doesn't seem to have the same problem with Eastern religions or Eastern philosophy, where it's much more about internal gods or internal spirituality, at least connection to, to oneself and, and maybe nature. Um, it's like, uh, with, with Muhammad and his, the culture of his day was many gods, the place where he lived in Mecca had uh, a meeting place where thousands of gods were kind of, um, on display and believed by the local people. And then of course, when he had his experience and brought the Quran in to, um, to the world, then it was all about one God again. And so I think there's this fracturing that happens and then it comes back into one and then a fracturing and then a one and Mormonism is unique because it's, it, they have their own kind of problem. Is it one or is it many? I've thought about this, like, okay, I'm going to, as, as a full believing Mormon, it's like, I didn't want to spend too much time thinking about this afterlife that I was, that I was putting so much energy into now for the sake of my afterlife. And yet, was I going to be a God? And then my dad going to be a God? Would he always be my dad? So there's like grandpa, grandpa gods. <laughs> um, and, and then there's supposedly this, the God who's the one that we worship let's say in Mormonism, it's this, the quote of as God is man can become as man is God once was something like that. Maybe I flipped those, but so in that case, there was another God. And so you have like this ladder, this, I guess it's a hierarchy unless once you obtain Godhood, you're all equal as gods. Uh, although I don't know that that was entirely clear. What are your thoughts? Well, um, this, yeah, this jumps down to eternal progression. And I think that, I mean, Christ said, be there for one, even as I, the father in heaven are one. So I believe in, you know, Eastern traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism is this belief that we are all one manifestations of, you know, a universal consciousness, uh, of Brahman, I think in mm -hmm. Buddhism, uh, but we are, uh, individual parts of it. And so this is very, to me, it's kind of like parts work in therapy. And I think that's the evolution from many gods. Well, first, you know, I think the concept of God and Satan is an outsourcing or projection of your inner positive and negative polarities and, you know, your shadow. And so, which is quite unfortunate because all good things, 
you know, it's not you, it's God. You know, those mm-hmm. th- good things are God. You're, you're putting that as a separate on a pedestal and, you know, glory to God, etc. And then Satan, the things that you do wrong, you know, it's, it's Satan. It's not you. You're not owning it. You're not taking accountability for, you know, those dark parts of you, the shadow of you, you're um, not integrating and you're not accepting and learning to understand and contextualize and integrate in and heal. It's Satan. And that's a, um, yeah, it's, there's no spiritual sovereignty there. And, but I think the yeah, polytheism is that, but it's a polytheism to monotheism is a progression from like outsourcing or giving up the, your sovereignty, your spiritual sovereignty to many gods to like, Oh, it's going in the right direction of like, Oh, actually everything's one, you know, it's one God, but it's still outside of you. It's something that you're not a part of. Whereas in Tibetan Buddhism, I think is one of the most helpful frameworks. Um, They have this idea of, Basically, oh, I had a quote. So I asked Chat GPT to summarize it because um, it does a pretty good job. So, yeah, this idea I mean, this is very inception like Christopher Nolan's movie. But uh, so in, in Tibetan Buddhism, our experience of reality can be divided into different layers of dreamlike states. Even with its own level of subtlety and clarity, these layers are said to be interconnected and ultimately rooted in a fundamental state of pure awareness or consciousness. The three main levels of dream states are the waking state. This is the most obvious level of reality. The one that we experience during our everyday waking life from the perspective of Tibetan Buddhism, this level of reality is still considered a kind of dream because our experience of it is colored by our perceptions, thoughts, and emotions. And then there's the dream state. This is the level of reality. So it's like one down that we experience when we dream at night in this state, our minds are still active, but our perceptions are not limited by our physical bodies or the constraints of physical reality. Tibetan Buddhists believe that this level of reality is a useful tool for exploring the nature of consciousness and the way that our minds create our experience of reality. And then the clear light state, which is like the level up in inception. Um, So the clear light state, this is the deepest level of reality where all distinctions and concepts dissolve into a state of pure awareness or consciousness. Tibetan Buddhists believe that this layer level of reality can be experienced during deep meditation or at the moment of death, and that it is the ultimate goal of spiritual practice. According to this view, each level of reality is nested within the others with the deeper levels containing and influencing the more superficial levels by understanding the nature of each level of reality and the connections between them, Tibetan Buddhists seek to gain insight into the nature of consciousness and the way that our minds create our experience of reality. So um, in this concept of idealism or that the universe is a consciousness and that we are just kind of fractalized subsets of that consciousness, you have... I mean, that sounds really weird. How can one consciousness be experiencing itself as me? If I'm part of a bigger consciousness, I mean, my experience is very real. I know that I am separate. I I have an identity and that you're separate. Um, But you only have to step into a dream to see this, that you've experienced this every night of your life, your whole consciousness, your whole mind goes into a state of consciousness or awareness where it fractalizes into a mini ego that's taking up a certain percentage of your whole consciousness. And then all the background, the other people, the world, everything that you view as separate from yourself in your dream is your higher self. Mm -hmm. And these, they feel so separate. It feels so real to be in a dream, but you laugh at other people's jokes. You're surprised by things. You're scared by things. Um, so Tibetan Buddhists practice dream yoga, this idea that you, um, practice meditation in a dream. And apparently I've not done it, but apparently some really crazy mystical things happen because, uh, what that is doing is, 
your mini ego in the dream, your dream self is recognizing it's one with everything. So, you know, in meditation, you're recognizing you're one with everything, getting into this um, expanded state of awareness. And I think it's a lot easier to collapse that into oneness uh, in the dream state because it's a smaller fractal of it. Mm. Uh, so less Ram. Yeah. Yeah. In that system. Yeah. So, and then, I mean, this can go further down, but then go back to lucid dreaming. So in lucid dreaming, you've got those different levels of lucidity. So when you gain lucidity in a dream, you are aware that you're in a dream. If you gain higher levels of lucidity or consciousness in the dream, you can start changing your reality because ultimately your reality is created by not the mini ego's consciousness, but the consciousness, the full consciousness of the sleeping person. And so if you can expand your awareness to such a high level at which your awareness starts merging with the full consciousness, starts being kind of gathered up into a consciousness, then you can do it, whatever you want in the dream. And then you can also gain awareness from that next level up. So then you apply this to the next level up, you know, our waking states, mm -hmm. again, we feel very separate from each other. Um, and this feels very real. And of course we're not in a dream, but that's what we just said, you know, a few hours ago when we were in a dream that we could have sworn that that was real. That was not a dream. And so if awareness and enlightenment and waking up is expanding our awareness, our consciousness. And if you reach these certain higher levels of consciousness where your consciousness starts merging back together with the next level up, and you start to, you know, the highest level of lucidity is you start having access to what's on the next level of inception mm -hmm. um, up. So to me, when I had this realization, I was like, holy cow, th this is eternal progression. Instead of like mm -hmm. God and then him having worlds and then them each having gods, like this is that eternal progression, but it's just stacked fractal layers of consciousness. And then one more thing to add to this is this concept that I was telling you about, uh, Bernardo Kastrup's, um, he's a computer science PhD and a philosophy PhD and his, you know, I'll link his interview that I really liked in the comments, but he goes right along with this, you know, so dreams are a great way to conceptualize reality as well as, um, this idea of dissociative identity disorder, or multiple personality disorder, where again, this is an idea. If you want to balk at the idea of how can a consciousness be separated into things that feel that they are very separate. Mm -hmm. These people with dissociative identity disorder, these are alter egos that are very separate and it's due to trauma generally where part of the consciousness quarantines itself off, walls it off, dissociates from the rest of the consciousness so that that trauma, uh, to spare the rest of the consciousness. So you have these separate yeah. alter egos and these are real separate egos. So he, he mentioned one study where the, the person claimed that one of their alter egos was blind and then they hooked him up to an EEG. And when that alter ego took over, uh, they had no activity in their, uh, visual center of their brain. Yeah. And then he, then he talked about this. So yeah, his, theory, which his framework is that the universe is consciousness and we are dissociated aspects of that consciousness. Everything is a dissociated aspect of that consciousness separated from the other. And I think the thing that really hit at home was he talked about them doing studies on dream recalls for these people with dissociative identity disorder. And a quarter of them, when they recalled their dreams, they recalled the dream differently from a different perspective, depending on which, depending on which alter ego Amazing. was uh, explaining it. So they were all, all the alter egos were experiencing the same dream as different characters yeah. that interacted with each other and all believed that they were separate and all had a separate knowledge. Wow. And, and the, if you look, if you see accounts, if you learn about dissociative identity disorder, I mean, these, this is real, these people, I mean, it's different from person to person, but they have different alter egos and they take control at different times. And sometimes they're co-conscious where they can kind of observe what the other alter ego is doing. Other times that alter ego shuts them out. So they don't have any access to it. And then 
the final thing that I think is fascinating and goes along with this framework is uh, this book on attachment that I read, uh, Attachment Disturbances in adult Adults. And they had 20, 30 pages of transcripts from this person with dissociative identity disorder healing all of the dissociated alter egos into one consciousness, one ego in the end. And Very they went, fine. yeah, so they went through therapy three, four years. Each, each alter ego, they were doing ideal parent figure stuff. So they had parent figures that were giving these alter egos, the things, the secure, secure attachment that they didn't have uh, growing up. And it was funny because they all, there was like 15 or 20 parents. Oprah Winfrey was one of the parents. Um, and they eventually, <laughs> eventually they yeah. all combined together. And there's some beautiful imagery in there about facets of a diamond and how they're all one. And it was that the darkest parts that had experienced the deepest trauma were the parts that took the longest to integrate. And they finally came out in the therapy sessions and finally felt worth and love and joined in. And so none of these parts were separate. I mean, in the end, they weren't snuffed out. They were all integrated together. And this is, I mean, this is, I think what awareness waking up reality is. And this is, I think what, you know, Zion being talked about as one heart, one mind. Um, I think that it's a, the most accurate framework and a very scientific framework for consciousness and the interconnectedness while also separateness um, of us. Yeah, it, incredibly powerful ideas. And I think particularly so from the, from the um, post-Mormon or at least just having exposure to Mormonism perspective um, because the, the yeah eternal progression it's almost like there's an analog to it and maybe a believing member would say it's a counterfeit but i would say it's no more counterfeit than you know any other model that fits that works outside of the dogma um and i'm thinking of buddha who was uh, a born a person of extreme privilege and his parents wanted to keep him from all pain and suffering. His dad, as I understand it, sheltered him, tremendously sheltered him uh, from seeing old people or seeing sick people or seeing any kind of violent act carried out by humans, just wanted to, and he was wealthy, so he could do this, basically kept him in a bubble. And when he came older in life, he decided, you know, I'm going to go out and see what the real world is. He went out, he saw old people for the first time. He saw sick people. He saw people suffering. And he was blown away at the level of suffering that goes on in the world. And then it was as he was meditating under the Bodhi tree, when he had his Gnostic moment or his um, awakening moment, where he basically transcended and he touched the earth and was enlightened. I think he became aware of this oneness. And it was his mission from that point forward. He said that every mind must be touched. Every mind must be awakened. It's like every tongue shall confess or every, um, you know, send out missionaries to all the world to, to teach this gospel. And that was Buddha's um, idea was like, once you have this enlightenment, then you that that's the way forward for us to all kind of recognize that we're all we're all one um and i think it's there's the hermetic principle of correspondence as above so below he lived such a sheltered suffer free life in the early part of his life that the pendulum had to swing back the other way that maybe the principle of rhythm also fits it had to swing back the other way to where he saw such extreme suffering and then his perspective was so wide as far as what humans are capable of, um, that I think he recognized it all actually as, as one continual thing. I think also the, the idea of a fractal uh, consciousness as is the universe, is the God, is the mind of all things, and it's played out in, in us or in all other living beings, it's almost too obvious because we emerge out from each other. Like we come out of each other when mm, we're born yeah. and we also, it's a family tree, right? So like the connections it's, 
the the tree symbology for all of it uh, i often find so um appropriate because the branches the leaves yeah it's all connected at the trunk it's all one thing we've just named things differently with the imaginary with the effective model that naming them will let us navigate the world uh but all the names are just names and divisions are just what we put on them there actually aren't any in reality hmm. yeah a couple couple more things since we dove into that which i think i mean that's the best model this, of this fractal nature of reality and I mean, I think a couple more things to really drive this home. One, I mean, the idea of that, like dream, the dream world is fake and the waking world is real, um, is somewhat nonsensical because your waking consciousness, uh, I mean, you, you think you're experiencing a physical reality, but really your brain just has all these neurons, uh, all these nerves that are taking sensory input from, you know, touch sound, smell, um, and it's taking and giving you an experience and it's just piping in sensory input and you're creating an experience from that. Um, your visual cortex, you know, different things are piping into different parts of your brain. When you're sleeping, all of those parts of your brain are doing the same thing. You know, your visual cortex, your movements, all of your brain is activating all the sensory parts of your brain are activating the same way. But the only difference is that it's kind of taken that cord that went to all the quote unquote external sensory things. And it's kind of just plugged it back into the brain itself. So you're, um, running reality, but you're running it on itself. So you're kind of processing recursively, you're processing, um, things from your subconscious things, emotions, things that you're, you know, I think, you know, dreams have a purpose and you're sorting things out, but it's the input is different, but it's the same consciousness reality. You're experiencing it. You're just experiencing it from a different source. Um, and, and then I think, so I think we've kind of well, we're well, into the field of idealism now, which really is the most accurate perspective, because really, if you explore these things, you realize you're only experiencing consciousness. That's all you could be sure of is consciousness. And so all these concepts that are really, um, considered woo and poo pooed and, uh, discredited in terms of, you know, astrology manifestation, changing reality, metaphysical things, psychic, uh, connections. Okay. If we show that there's a pretty logical case for, um, uh, viewing reality as a sort of dissociation of a universal consciousness in your dream, when you gain lucidity, yeah, your higher brain comes online, your amygdala calms down because you realize there's an illusory nature of the reality that you're experiencing. So you're able to function higher, your reptilian brain, your primitive instincts kind of quiet down and you're operating these higher levels of consciousness. And as you gain this awareness, uh, in the dream, then you start to be able to change the reality. You can have psychic connections with the other players in the dream, you realize you are everything. You are the background, you are the other people, the other people in your dream, they are you, but you just change the definition of what you are because you realize that you're not the mini ego anymore. You're the person lying in bed sleeping. And so scale all that. I mean, if we into this framework of stack layers of consciousness, okay. And our, um, and then astrology too. I mean, things appear in your dream. Your subconscious speaks in metaphors because it's the more primitive. Um, your dreams speak in metaphor because it's the more primitive, older form. You know, language as a con construct is much later. And so this is what your mm -hmm. brain and subconscious, your dreams run on. And so things appear in the dream. Um, they are manifestations of they're symbolically other aspects of the thing in your daily life that you're trying to process. Um, I'm reading a book on, 
uh, it's why we dream. And it's just a new theory about how our dreams are basically expectation, fulfillment, you know, repressed emotions, situations during the day that didn't go to completion. You got activated, but didn't go to completion at night. It's kind of this garbage collection where your brain just kind of pattern matches and finds different things in your brain to allow you to go to fulfillment to kind of discharge these systems so that you can have a clean slate, keep these instinctual responses. And so it talks about how different things during the day will manifest symbolically in the dreams. So jump back up to reality, you know, waking life. Um, so the idea of being one with things, other people being a reflection of you, being mirrors of you, being reflections of a higher sense of self, other aspects of yourself, you know, shadow work, um, astrology, things in the quote unquote physical world, having some sim symbolic meaning. Um, again, it's, materialism is a myth. It's a useful myth, a useful construct. But when you really explore reality and, and consider the merits of idealism, and I mean, just this idea of this universal unconscious that Jung talks about, um, if everything is kind of this universal conscious, uh, you know, if there's a universal unconsciousness that these archetypes and dreams can pull from, then, you know, why, how is it crazy to think that stars, planets, as, as, astronomical objects would have some significance, especially if as a society, as a universal unconsciousness, we've been believing that they have um, significance over time too. But again, in this dream, uh, view, um, this inception view, Tibetan Buddhist view, um, it's not crazy at all to this, these ideas of manifestation, which I mean, maybe it's a little crazy if you're talking about, oh, I'm going to do these certain things, and then all of a sudden it's going to pop into my life. Um, I think the key actually is raising your level of consciousness, expanding your awareness so that you're not actually just experiencing this little dissociated consciousness that represents your body and yourself but tapping into this universal consciousness. And then there's kind of this two way street where you have some precognition of other things that are going on in the rest of the consciousness and, or you have um, a seat at the table in kind of voting what shows up in the, in the dream. So I think, I would think it, I think it normalizes uh, some of these things that are just dismissed as nonsensical. Yeah. Yeah, the dismissing is the, I think, the part that slows everything down. It's really, uh, I, I think from an evolutionary perspective, we're really just things that piled up on top of each other, you know, extremely simplified kind of quip. Um, because I'm reading this book about gravity and how gravity it pulls, it goes in all directions or it, um, every piece of matter is interacting at a, gr on a gravity level with every other piece of matter. Um, like you have gravity to the earth, but the earth's just so much bigger of a mass that your gravity is not changing the earth, but there's some level of gravity there. And so astro astrology makes sense from the perspective that like Saturn and Jupiter, Venus, these things, um, they're pulling on the earth, they're affecting the earth. And I think anciently, before people had really definitive ways of defining what they are, and how those things work way up there, they could see that there was some impact, some effect. Happening. Well, I mean, this is, I guess I disagree a little bit. So this is what Car this is how Carl Sagan um, dismissed astrology because he said how could astrology how could the the placement of the stars and the planets have any effect on you like the placement when you were born have any effect on you or your life because the gravity of those because the only force that would be connecting those things and you would be gravity that's the only force that works that long that far and the gravity of those 
objects, celestial objects, is so much less than the gravity that the midwife or the doctor would have on you. So I think, it, yes, gravity is affecting everything. Uh, but again, that's from that's trying to explain it from a materialist perspective. Well, where... I'm only sorry, I'm only using that as a model to describe that it's all connected ultimately as one. Mm -hmm. But go, but go. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think, yeah, astrology from a materialist perspective is crazy. Um, but again, that's a presuming that materialism is correct, and and I, I think that. There's not, a, I think ultimately it's a force for idealism, but yeah, I mean, ultimately everything, you know, the idea that things are entangled from collision, from splitting, um, you look back at the big bang, everything actually came from the same thing. So you can't explain, I don't think it helps to, yeah. I think there is justifiable criticism for just saying, oh, everything's connected and entanglement means that you can change something on the other side of the world. Um, I think it's just a principle that you can see that there are connections that are not materialistic in nature. And yeah, but I, I mean, I think from Jung's perspective, and I think this is why Jung was open to astrology, um, was because, again, he viewed life as an idealist, even though he criticized idealism, I think he really just had his own flavor of idealism and he viewed there as a literal universal subconscious where there's a repository where everything is connected and you draw thoughts and dreams from. And so everything outside of you is, can be a manifestation. That's why he believed in synchronicity to this idea that things can happen and they're not coincidences, but they're reflections of these archetypes and these, the symbolism. So I think, again, if you surrender and are open to the idea of idealism, all of these things can have a basis. It's not that you can explain how exactly they all work. Um, mm. Yeah, I do think that, um, like that universal unconscious that Jung talked about, and you know, there's a talk about an Akashic record, like that, that there is all information is held in like the current reality that can be tapped into. Um, and I think all of that stuff kind of starts to come together with the idea of, um, with idealism, mm -hmm. because with materialism, it's all, it seems like uh, so much cause and effect and past and present. And yet time seems to be the t time as the way that I think we interact with it from day to day is so much of a, so much of a construct. And I mean, it just ancient people whose time was dictated by the movement of stars and of the change of the seasons and of nature much more connected. And now our time is the ticking second and the, the numbers on the screen, right? And um, maybe we'll get back to a more nature-based timekeeping at some point, hopefully, because I think our circadian rhythms and the way our bodies have come up through time has to do much more with nature than the digital numbers on a screen. So in other words, I think idealism is the cradle and materialism is a functional model that's that's nested inside of it i think nested is a great word for it um and and it's not like we get rid of one or we get rid of the other it's it's like it's not like we get rid of religion and we only have atheism it's not like we get rid of it's this on the conversation is there because of both it's like there must be opposition in all things that's because it exists when there's those two poles i don't know that a lot of this exists with the with one side winning the argument. I don't even think it's well, I think, around. I mean, I think actually you supersede both of them and just move into a. Uh, I mean, I think right now we have science and we have religion, and there are two competing frameworks or models to describe reality, and they have different approaches. One's kind of the how, and the other one's the why. Um, 
but they are at odds with each other. And anybody that says that they are completely reconcilable, I, I don't think is, is accurate because it's been yet to be done. Um, I think that, you know, we're never, truth is ineffable. You know, why do we think that we could understand quote unquote God or truth within the constructs that we've developed? I mean, we've evolved language and these are just words that we say about something, you know, an apple doesn't actually describe an apple. So the idea that we can fully comprehend truth, big T truth with language and constructs um, is silly, but that doesn't mean that we can't get more and more accurate models that have closer and closer approximations. And so I think, yeah, I think the next step is superseding religion and superseding scientific materialism. Um, but, but, but an integration of integration. spirituality and science and realizing that there, you can actually have a framework that explains the how and the why you have to let go of some of the things, you know, you have to let go of the, a lot of specifics. <laughs> well, you have to let go of the idea that storks bring you babies. You know, that was a framework that you use because you didn't want to explain where babies come from and it's useful. Um, but then there's a, some, a certain point at which you graduate on. And you talked about this, you know, the idea of Christianity and Eastern philosophy, uh, you know, these are constructs, these are frameworks. And I think you said something like, you know, the, the biggest mistake that we can do is to keep holding on to the frameworks once we've outlived them. And so I think spirituality is, can be liberated from religion, but yeah, you have to figure out, okay, if you're going to in, integrate two frameworks, you have to figure out what's accurate of them and what's not, because they don't fit together as most people understand them right now. So there are some things that are wrong. You have to be open to abandoning everything to finally figure out what pieces come together um, when you when you put them together. Well, and I think a lot of it, it's, it's no different than what we're talking about, kind of that broader model of the consciousness being fractaled images of itself through manifesting through all of us in that there's different ways to view it and unifying or integrating all of them somehow, which does involve surrendering. It does involve giving up dogmatic approaches. Um, but it seems to me, it's interesting. It's like you, you, I read about quantum uh, theory or um, physicists right now who are finding that like the, the whole, um, wave or particle discussion and the, the, the kind of the what's under reality, it's almost like there's a branch of science that is becoming a lot more spiritual. And yet the current religions seem to be becoming a lot more dogmatic. Like this is the way unbending can't be mm -hmm. different than this. And yet there's science, there are scientists in the field to me that seem to be like, wow, there's actually something deeper beneath all of this that we can't even, maybe we'll never be able to see. Um, uh, and then the in between is everything else. Um, and I think that's kind of what this whole discussion we're trying to have with these episodes eventually gets to is that integration of the things around us. It's like the pinnacle of hubris to think that you were born in a time where the capital T truth had been discovered, even though for thousands of years with billions of humans all over the world in different places with completely different cultures um, that they didn't have it, but you have it. And for me, I like I had to confront that as a full believing Mormon, eventually realize that that is the pinnacle of hubris. That's the absolute. It's like, has language even evolved far enough for us to describe what reality is? go back a couple thousand years ago, there's way less words to even use. And yet there was functional models and ways to describe what was going on in the world and that allowed people to live valid lives. And, um, and we just, the, the, the notion that it's here, that it's now, that it's us, that it's this level of language that we've evolved, that we have the sensory data, that we have the, mm -hmm. the instruments and that we've, we've got what it is. I think it's everybody's pipe dream that in their lifetime, it's all discovered. Uh, or what's even more depressing to me is that I was, 
that you could be born into a family that tells you we have all of the truth already all here. It's like on the Truman show when he, he wants to, as a kid, he's like, Hey, I want to go exploring. And they pull down the map. They're like, it's already all been discovered. <laughs> and I think that's, it, that is a, an, a very fitting analogy that the world has been explored, except there are still deep mysteries. One of those is the unconscious mind of the human and the collective unconscious, which I think we're just starting to scratch. Maybe I think that there's a lot of parallels with that and what's at the bottom of the ocean. Once we find out what's at the bottom of the ocean, we'll know more about what's our, what our gut microbiome actually is doing with our entire body, that the brain isn't just up here, that the brain is kind of in both places. And that the more we probe deeper into the galaxy with new telescopes we put out there or into the universe, I think there's a lot of connections with as we dig deeper, that will lead to it's like one part of the collective conscious is working toward finding out where the beginning of the Big Bang was. And another part is looking at where, uh, like what's going on really at the bottom of the ocean. Another part is what's going on inside the human microbiome. And they seem to be pushing those boundaries kind of mm -hmm. at the same speed in a lot of ways. And so there's a, a revelation kind of, domino effect yeah it's, think, in other words they're seemingly separate they're seemingly disparate or they're seemingly different fields or there's specialists in seemingly different places that are like probing for truth i actually think it kind of expands just like the universe expands what looks like it's expanding uh, mm -hmm. from the big bang it's kind yeah. of expanding like that and i think i mean i think a great model of knowing the limit of comprehension is is this idea of photogrammetry so this is taking two-dimensional images and constructing a three-dimensional object so we are seeing you know from our state of consciousness our ego uh, we are seeing two-dimensional pictures of something and we've been looking at something in one perspective for quite a while being raised mormon or whatever your perspective is and you think that's truth and it is truth. Uh, and then all of a sudden you get transported onto the other side of the object and, and you're like, whoa, wait a second. I was wrong. What I thought was true, you know, instead of this coin being tails, no, this is actually heads. This is a heads coin. And then you eventually start to realize, I mean, you go from this moral absolutism to moral relativism, or I guess, maybe not moral, but you go from this absolutism of like, oh, I have truth. I see this two-dimensional picture. I know what, what this is. And then you often get flipped to the other side of that. And then you see, oh, wait, no, I know this, this is truth. You know, I was wrong, the other perspective. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes you'll, you slip into this idea like, oh, well, actually, you know, everybody has their own truth. You know, there is no absolute truth. But once you start taking more and more pictures from every different angle and you recognize each of those is a true accurate representation of this object of reality of big T truth within a certain framework. Some of them are more accurate. If you look at the side of the coin, you're not really going to get a lot of information. But so that's some, that's what some people are working off of. And they, they think that they've got absolute truth as you sum all of those perspectives up, stitching them together, then you start to, to gain a summation of all perspectives and you start converging back onto absolute truth again. So from absolutism to relativism, back to absolutism, but you're, you're just summing all two dimensional views into a three dimensional view. And that goes yeah. on and on and on through dimension to dimension. Um, just like, yeah, it started out with cave paintings and then more sophisticated artwork and then eventually sculpting and, and now sculpting in the 3d world. And that involves like at making movies where they're taking pictures of things in the 3d in, in our realm and then putting them into the, the virtual world and getting a clear replication of it. It's just like that. And I think, um, so you've got this framework of dream states that it's pretty exciting because if you look at consciousness in that way, you realize that there is consciousness at every level. I mean, the, the dream ego is a 
consciousness, you know, so this idea of consciousness is actually just a perspective of reality. And so you can view things from different perspectives too. So you can go up or down the fractal each, you know, you can wake up into the waking life. Um, but then you realize there's another level above you and it just keeps going and going. So um, that blows my mind of like, you actually never will reach the end of truth, but you'll get more and more. And it's also that these, those levels of consciousness are happening at the same time too. So if you think of yourself as a body, you are an integrated individual, but you're also made up of smaller conscious agents, these smaller cells and bacteria and whatnot. And each of those have their own perspective. And I think the gaining awareness, waking up is this idea, you know, you're a cell and you think you have free will and you're, you're choosing what to do. Um, but then in another sense, you actually don't have free will because it's all somewhat deterministic. You're just responding to stimuli and, uh, chemicals and signals. And then you realize, oh, you're, you're part of something bigger actually. And you may not have free will, but the body that you're part of has free will and you are both the cell and you're also the body at the same time. And this is kind of what Christ talks about, you know, or I guess Paul talks about in his epistles of, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, what need have the, this part of the body have for the other, but you're actually, you are the cell and you're also the body and you actually can shift your awareness from the awareness of the cell to the body. And as you gain that greater awareness, you're able to zoom into the smaller awareness, you know, so we are, we are collections of neurons collections. that are themselves conscious, you know, because everything is consciousness and they are interacting and they have, they themselves are aggregates of atoms. And then we are interacting with each other basically as neurons. I mean, you look at the mm -hmm. roads and then you zoom out and you look at the galaxy, the star systems. And again, from idealism, you realize there's consciousness happening on every mm -hmm. level at the same quote unquote time. And so it's not that we are linearly going to graduate to another level of consciousness. It's just, we, it's like you're in a security control room and you've been just looking at one camera the whole time. And then you're able to zoom back and you realize, oh, I can look at all of the cameras at the same time or I can zoom back into the one camera. So that's my perspective of consciousness and these altered states of expanded states of consciousness, mystical states is you're actually taking your perspective and you're zooming out. These are powerful ideas. And I think um, like corporations, you know, we have this argument or this discussion, this conversation going online about AI, artificial intelligence. And it's always the question of like, when does it become conscious or whatever, but consciousness, it, we look at, look up the definition for consciousness and there's a lot of different ways to define it. But I like what, what you're saying about these collections. We're a collection of smaller things that become something together. It's that gestalt idea that, that the, the sum is greater than, or the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And there's a lot of research showing about how the gut microbiome uh, it has a lot to do with depression or other kind of um, mental states. And yeah, I, I think of corporations as being, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to argue that a corporation isn't a, just a conscious entity interacting in the world, especially the bigger, more powerful ones. And they, in America, they even have voting privilege, right? So like the, the corporation has a head and it's got all of these other other parts of it, the labor parts of it, the, the mobile parts. I think it's, it's empowering to think of yourself as, as um, part of that whole, because we get caught up in the notion of we want, of wanting to, to be the, maybe if there's an analogy of like, well, we want to be the brain part that experiences all of the fun and all of the power and all of the um, kind of orgasm or whatever it is that's going on in in the body we want to be the part that experiences that and we we neglect the part that we just already have in the whole 
the whole thing that's happening here. Like there's this idea in Hinduism about Dharma where, yeah, and there's some problems with it, with like classism and things like that. Um, different caste, caste systems that can be, that can be very limiting, but there is underneath there, I think there's something of value to say that you are a part of something that is already great. And there is a perfection in that something because there is the, the judgment of, um, of bad and good and, and the shame, especially that comes with, I think, Western religions with Christianity, with Mormonism, for sure, is can be very destructive and getting away from the notion that I'm doing it wrong, or I was born already imperfect, or I was born already into this fallen place that we're born into this terrible place. That sets you off on this wrong foot. It set me off on the wrong, the wrong foot. And it wasn't until I recognized the, the perfection in the system that's already there, which means the, the perfection of some part of me that's a part of all of this, uh, or the whole of me that's a part of all of this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, day to day, um, we all make mistakes. We all know what mistakes mean and, and all of that. But I mean, bigger than that is that we're part of something that is not unlike the cosmos with all of their clockwork moving together that formed this whole place where consciousness could express itself in the way that we are doing it. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we uh, didn't get far in the play as a salvation, but so <laughs> the nature, yes, the nature of God, you know, Mormonism teaches that, you know, that Joseph Smith's first vision was so singular and so amazing because like it's re restoring this truth that had been lost, that God has a body of flesh and bones, that he's a man, that he's, um, yeah. But you see that that actually is not unique to Mormonism. Um, and then that his idea of the plurality of gods as well, um, which is really trippy if you read King Follett's discourse. Um, so those are two things that come from many places, but seem to come from um, the Kabbalah. Uh, then pre-earth life, we'll get a little further, I think, in this episode. So pre-earth life, um, interestingly enough, there's this, I, even though this, mortal existence is supposed to be when you're proving yourself and choosing right and wrong when satan's tempting you the plan of salvation as interesting as it is it really doesn't add up um, because there is this idea of faithfulness in the pre-earth life um, and this war in heaven which is kind of interesting because like well who is tempting people to not follow god if satan actually isn't um yeah, there yet. So you've got this idea that there's this war in heaven. God says, who's going to, you know, we've got this plan. People need to go down, be tested. And who's going to make it happen? Lucifer comes forward like, you know, I'm going to, I mean, actually, Lucifer, I mean, Lucifer, again, if you, uh, if you read some of the interesting ideas, I think on Gnosticism, on angels and stuff, it really Lucifer is playing a, an important role. Um, he's causing the negative polarity. He's causing the balance there. And Lucifer is different than Satan too. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if it's Gnostic cosmology, but in the angel cosmology, but so yeah, Lucifer says, I'll do it. I'll save everybody. I'm going to yell at the glory. And that that's not a good plan. Um, and Christ says, you know, I'll do it. I'll give you the glory of God. Um, but there's this, so I'm going to make the case, we're going to make the case in this, that the plan of salvation is like a little snapshot of reincarnation and not reincarnation where you're going, coming back from um, different animals, but multiple probations, which is more of the new age perspective and I guess less Hindu. But so there's a couple of quotes about this interesting idea that, you know, even though they say it's a pre-earth life, I mean, it really sounds very similar to new age thought of multiple times you're coming down here. You're just a part of this conscious, your God experiencing itself, a little fractalized version that's coming here and you're going through certain things to experience what it is. You're experiencing itself as infinity. So 
a couple quotes that are interesting. This is Melvin J. Ballard, Sermons and Missionary Service of Mel Melvin J. Ballard, page 20, 248. Quote, why is it in this church we do not grant the priesthood to the Negroes? This is on Blacks of the Priesthood, that Blacks were not allowed to have the priesthood until 1978. It is alleged that the Prophet Joseph Smith said, and I have no reason to dispute it, that it is because of some act committed act committed by them before they came into this life. It is alleged that they were neutral, standing neither for Christ nor the devil, but I am convinced it is because of some of the things they did before they came into this life that they have been denied the privilege. The races of today are largely reaping the consequences of a previous life, which again, if you didn't think he was talking about the previous life, it really sounds like reincarnation and the concept of karma, uh, which is the idea that you, every action has an opposite or every action has a reaction basically. And that things that you do in previous lives, you actually have to experience it from the other perspective, uh, this energy that you're in balance that you're bearing. Another quote, this is by Marky e. Peterson, race problems as they affect the church in 1954. We cannot escape the conclusion that because of performance in the pre-existence, some of us are born as Chinese, some as Japanese, some as Indians, some as Negroes, and some, some as Americans, some as Latter-day Saints. These are rewards and punishments fully in harmony with his established policy in dealing with sinners and saints, rewarding all according to their deeds, which again, it's, uh, this is the concept of karma that they're in a previous existence that you can't remember. You did something and then you have to experience kind of consequences or experience the other side of it here. So, and it's, uh, it's really, it's tough to hear there. Uh, I, I guess it's kind of comical to hear how antiquated and offensive these ideas are. It is. It's hard to hear. It's hard to listen to that, that, that those were considered the, you know, the holy men speaking the word of God. Uh, we've come a long way, thankfully, from those ideas. It's a pretty inefficient thing, this revelation, having a prophet seer and revelator. So this uh, coming down to earth life, the purpose is to gain a body, to be tested, to gain experience. Again, this is pretty similar to these ideas of, you know, you're, you chose this life, you have these near-death experiences, talk a lot about this cosmology of like, you choose what life, you choose what parents. Um, and this is very similar to Saturday's Warrior stuff loved that movie as a kid <laughs> by the way it was only later that i realized the cool kids in the movie that were trying to get um what's his name <laughs> the main character guy uh um, yeah it's been yeah. so long but yeah that's, they were actually cool i mean that's <laughs> it's funny because that story even though it's not mormon doctrine i mean it comes from these ideas of you know you're the chosen ones you you know you've chosen yeah i think these are things that were said over the pulpit here and there and maybe not codified oh, in standard works but it's funny you listen to that that is so so similar to what near-death experience people talk about you know that you choose your parents you choose why you came down to this life because in a previous life you know you made fun of people because of their looks and now in this life you're choosing to be disfigured or to be ugly and that makes you know it makes sense uh, these, these are either near-death experiences or past life regressions. People talk about these things. And New Age, there's this idea of soul contracts too, where, you know, this, your father was this, you know, cruel dictator or whatever, you know, it was really hard living. You know, you didn't know why you had to deal with this person or to deal with this, yeah, deal with this person. But then on the higher level, you know, when you go back to your higher soul, or back before this life, you actually made a contract that, you know, hey, I need to learn this lesson down there. And the other person's like, yeah, I'm going to teach you this, this lesson. And, you know, we're going to, because you're at a higher level of consciousness, you're higher, higher up in the fractal. And so, I mean, these ideas of being married in past lives, I and mean, these are all new age things. And it's so, so similar to Saturday's Warrior, uh, that it's mm -hmm. funny. And it's not like, I mean, it's not like new age philosophy copied Mormonism. I don't think they care about Mormonism. Um, these things sort of evolved independently because they come from the same traditions, esoteric uh, explorations. 
Um, well, it's, I think a lot of it is the, um, trying to reconcile the world was once an East and West. The world was once, uh, part of it didn't know about the other part of it. And then in a modern age where the ideas flowed, uh, and it, what's really interesting is how much Islam actually saved Western philosophy after the library of Egypt of Alexandria mm -hmm. was burned and so much of the, um, Western like ideas from Plato and so many other philosophers and Western uh, philosophers was lost until until uh, Islamic people who had translated them and started informing Islamic philosophy with some of those ideas kind of brought it back and gave it back to the West. So ideas that kind of circulated through and now with new age uh, uh, ideas, I think it's a kind of an evolution. It's the stacking up on top of itself mm. and continuing to have, uh, I, I still, I really feel like you, to, in order to have a spiritual connection, you have to be pressing the boundaries of the, of the mind and you have to be pressing the boundaries of the heart for those to operate in kind of harmony at their highest vibratory level. And so giving in all the way to a notion of, oh, like science is going to be the thing that saves humanity and neglecting the past is, I think it's folly. I think it's a weakness. I think the integration of them all. So the new age uh, uh, reincarnation kind of analog and Mormonism's pre, what well, used to be called pre-existence, but at some point pre-existence Somebody acknowledged that it kind of <laughs> doesn't make sense. Is it doesn't make sense. So, so then it became pre-earth pre -earth earth life or pre-mortal, pre-mortal life, pre-earth life. Um, and if you think about just what we that that notion that we are things that stacked up on top of each other, and when we die, those things spread out and become something else that gets to stand up and walk around for a little while. Reincarnation is obvious from that perspective. And then if there is a Akashic, Akashic record or some kind of collective data stream contained in all matter, then all those things that are coming down into the world and then spreading out again and then coming back up to stand up as a tree or a squirrel or a human are containing all of that information and at some level, especially with human culture, a collective unconscious that keeps information kind of rolling. And now with the internet, we're just magnified that connectivity by billions and billions uh fold yeah it's their, their reincarnation is a meaningful idea and can be i think kind of worked through from a lot of different perspectives to, to where it's like this served people for a long time and there's meaning in it today yeah and again it's uh i mean these are all stories or constructs that are seeking Models. to explain what is inexplicable. So reincarnation, dreams, stack dream states. I mean, they're all just different two-dimensional pictures that if you can understand them all and integrate them together, then you finally get a glimpse of the three-dimensional um, object that's really there. So in Mormonism, it's kind of flipped from Gnosticism. So Gnosticism teaches that the physical world is a prison. Um, Mormonism teaches that yeah, we had to come down here to gain a physical body because God has a physical body, um, which which I think is kind of interesting. So I viewed, so you had, I mean, Christianity, so reality is paradox and it's the collapsing of paradox or the holding of both sides of the paradox to find the middle way. And it's not, it's not taking negative 10 and taking 10 and saying, oh, the truth is zero. It's actually the truth is negative 10, 10. Mm. You know, it's both of those. Wave or particle. Both. Yeah, it's 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 a wavicle. And so I, I view what Joseph Smith was wrestling with and kind of what he restored was, you know, Christianity at the time, you know, there was the council, you know, Nicene Creed. I mean, they were describing the ineffable nature of God. You know, it's big as this, small as this you know, everywhere, mm -hmm. nowhere. So they really were actually doing a good awesome. job of making it <laughs> ineffable. Um, but yeah. then they lost the connection with us, you know, our divine, that we are God, uh, that, and we are physical. That's, and so that's too empowering. That's too far too empowering mm -hmm. for what the, the state of civilization based in like a hierarchical, such a vertical structure 
you couldn't give individuals their spiritual sovereignty or any mm -hmm. kind of spiritual power or freedom like that. And, I mean, that, that's evident in the killing of the Gnostics and the suppression of the likely psychedelic Eucharist. Yeah. Is, you know, pe having people merge with and experience the divine themselves. Salem it. witch trials. Yeah. Anytime people started making spiritual progress, they got snuffed out. So, so they, you know, one side of the paradox was represented and Joseph Smith, I think was tapping into with the esoteric traditions, tapping into the other side of the paradox, but he just went too overboard on the other side, you know, instead of God being ineffable, it's like, no, God is a man. We can become like him. And it's just very literal interpretation of it. Um, and so, so yeah, this purpose of this life is to gain a body, to be tested because we need to have a body to be perfected, to be like God, but it, that's very similar. So new age spirituality, so just, I guess, spirituality, um, there, it's a very common concept that God, the universe, cosmos, the, the, all the infinite intelligence, it's, it's it infinite intelligence and infinity can't experience itself without polarizing itself and having a positive and negative polarity, a light and a darkness, light and shadow. And so by polarizing itself, by fractalizing itself, by giving itself the illusion of separateness that can create this physical world where we all feel like we're separate. And this is, I think the Hindu idea of, I'm going to paraphrase it, but that God, kind of gets bored it's awake for a while and then there's a period of slumber where i guess mm -hmm. it gets bored or something it sleeps it disguises itself in the dream and it rediscovers itself through the dream that it's actually in the dream all the other parts of the dream are itself so so yeah there is this concept of you know we are all little individuals apart individualized fractals of God, the cosmos, infinite, infinity that are experiencing it. We're going down to these lower dimensions to just experience polarity and to experience this physical uh, uh, existence. Um, and then I think maybe we can wrap up with this, the council of the gods. So Joseph Smith in Abraham three talks about this council of the gods, Elohim, uh, that we talked about the great and the noble ones and coming together, creating the world. So D. Michael Quinn uh, says regarding the King Follett discourse, Hamlin, so William Hamlin again, which interesting, um, William Hamlin, I was, this is the story I was telling you about the other day. He's a, he was a, an apologist for farms, maybe fair. I'm not sure. But anyway, he published a, um, this is the guy that published the, a journal article in one of these apologist journal, but it had an acrostic that was taking a low blow at Brent Metcalf, who's the, who's been written some stuff on the book of Mormon and different ways that it could be produced. I think comparing it to automatic writing. And so there was an acrostic where the first letter of each of the paragraphs ended up saying Metcalf is butthead in reference to Beavis and butthead. So it's very interesting. There's some, mm -hmm. a lot of drama that goes on in among the apologists. And I think you can kind of see it in how. I mean, it's the ultimate uh, ego expression. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm, I mean, here I am on a podcast, right? It's <laughs> pretending like I actually know what the heck I'm talking about, but there, there is a lot of ego stroking that goes on when you can, stand up publicly for something. And I think, I mean, I think there is a shadow of repressed knowledge at some point that this doesn't all add up and, but you need it to add up. And yeah, I mean, I, I was that way. So Hamblin relentlessly attacked the claim of Owens that Joseph Smith derived the following statements from the Kabbalah quote, the head God called together the gods and sat in grand, grand council to bring forth the world. And quote, in the beginning, the head of the gods called a council of the gods and they came together and concocted or prepared a plan to create the world and people it. And that's from the history of the church. 
uh, from Joseph Smith. Indeed, Hamlin claimed that these ideas and phrasings were Smith's unique contributions, yet based on the Bible, Hamlin asserted, quote, the ideas that Joseph allegedly borrowed from Kabbalism are also found in biblical texts, end quote. But this farm's polemicist well knows, he's very um, frustrated with, the, with these guys, well knows that there is no biblical ref reference to, quote, the Council of the Gods, end quote. Contrary to Hamlin, Joseph Smith apparently borrowed this idea directly from Eisenmenger's Tradition of the Jews, last published in 1748. In his discussion of the 70 ang angels who figure so prominently in the Kabbalah, Eisenmenger wrote, quote, the 70 princes are called Elohim, i.e. gods. They are also called God's council. And the words go, go to, let us go down and there confound the language are said to have been spoken of them. And quote, Smith adopted this polytheistic use of Elohim and the concept of God's council of gods, then shifted these concepts from Eisenmenger's discussion about the Tower of Babel before the King Follett discourse applied Eisenmenger's concepts and phrasing to the creation account a few chapters earlier in Genesis, Smith had already applied this, quote, let us go down, phrasing to the creation. Smith's translation or revelation of the writings of Abraham in chapter four stated, quote, and then the Lord said, let us go down. And they went down at the beginning and they said, that is the gods organized and formed the heavens and the earth, end quote. This let us go down phrase is not in Genesis 1 or 2 about the creation, but was in Genesis eleven seven about the Tower of Babel, where Eisenmeiger emphasized Elohim and a council of gods. In its discussion of the Hebrew Bible's verses regarding Babel, the 1842 English version of Manasseh ben Israel did not refer to Elohim or to gods. So, again, this is another thing that goes along with this narrative that I really realized reading this book that almost everything that I thought was unique about Mormonism was not unique. Baptisms of the dead, the temple ceremony, um, or just the idea of a temple, you know, that was happening in the 1700s at the effort of cloister near Peter Whitmer, that priesthood of Melchizedek that was also going, going on. Uh, Melchizedek priesthood was also going on after cloister, Elohim, council of the gods, you know, this becoming like gods. I mean, these are all things that as a kid, I was like, oh, these are uniquely Mormon concepts. And like, isn't it great that we know this and just this idea of Elohim and there, there are very, very, very few things that are unique. And, and I think Joseph Smith ultimately, I mean, it actually wasn't about getting unique things. He was integrating, he was integrating mm -hmm. esoteric things together and did an amazing job actually in creating a Western esoteric religion. Yeah. Yeah. I, sometimes I wonder if Joseph Smith would have been granted like $10 million, would he have? It, it, so, so it's almost like so much of what he was doing was being kind of, he was chasing himself or he was at war with himself because of his kind of, um, carnal desires let's say or, or whatever like he, he he wanted shadow power yeah his shadow he wanted power he wanted money he wanted he obviously had some uh, some sexual things uh going on because of the, the polygamy and the under the, the young women and things it's like if he would have just had enough money to be stable could he have could he have crafted something that uh was even better than Mormonism, you know, who, who knows? That's all just, yeah. And he's, uh, I mean, he's also, but... and he's also a product of, yeah, the trauma of his childhood and their poverty and yeah, having these experiences, you know, I think it, he did have these mystical experiences and being told by people that you are crazy. I mean, there is a persecution complex. You can talk about ego of organizations. There's a persecution complex that the ego of, the church has, and there's some narcissistic traits, I think, that the church has that they're, they're not in the business of making apologies. I mean, that's what Holland said, you know, they really, really struggle with making apologies. But I think, yeah, you can see Joseph Smith's life and how he became who he was. And I think you can see these repressed things in the Book of Mormon too, you know, condemning polygamy, um, justifying the murder of Laban so that you can put forth a, a book out there that's going to save the world. I think it justifies mm -hmm. fraud, the core horror stuff. I mean, I think that lines up with this calling an election being made sure the Gadiantian robbers, it sure looks like the Danites. And 
you know, this was what, from a Jungian perspective, I think this is what happens when you repress and suppress and don't integrate in like, you know, it's okay to be a sexual being. It's okay to want power. It's okay to want money. Um, find a healthy way to integrate those mm -hmm. things in um, and gain wholeness. So, all right. Well, I think that Thank yeah, we you. took a, we took a long detour into reality, but that was good. And yeah. we'll pick up next time on the creation. So it's good to know your fractal version of the, uh, collective consciousness Gabe. Yeah. The, it's good to know the part of the consciousness that is you. Oh yeah. Gabe. You too. <laughs> All right. You're a cool fractal, man. All right. All right. Have a good night. You too. <laughs>